Welcome to the Piedmont Unitarian Universalist Church. Piedmont UU sits on the traditional lands of the Catawba, Kiowi, and Sugaree peoples. My name is Robin Mara, and I'll be worship assistant today for Reverend Dr. Amy Rio. We, Piedmont UU Church, we are a vi flourishing, vibrant, and radically welcoming congregation, which promotes diversity, inclusion, and social justice. We provide a safe haven for creative intellectual growth, spiritual development, and a deep sense of community for all who join us. We hope our liberal religious values will challenge you to join us as a community that lives boldly and acts justly. To all our visitors and members, we're very glad you're here, whether we're with us in person or online, and we hope to see you again. Your presence is a gift to us. We have some announcements for this Sunday, and um, first of all, Becky Schisler has an announcement for our, about our holiday giving tree. She's going to come right on up. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I am going to be as brief as possible, but I think it's important to tell you a little bit of the history um, of this gift program and Piedmont UU's invo unofficial involvement in it up to this point. Um, I started Compassion Closet in 2020 amidst the you know, COVID outbreak, and so when the holidays started to come around, we had no intention of doing a holiday gift program. We were just trying to figure out how to get clothing and household items to folks in Charlotte. But then a school down in Charlotte contacted me and said, do you um, know how we might be able to do a giving tree? Do you have anybody with young children who might benefit from this? And I thought, oh, absolutely. How many families do you want to be connected with? And they said 40. And I thought, that's amazing. So I contacted 40 families, and I got names and wish lists. And by the end of October, I had sent them that list um, to the school. And I thought, great, that's wonderful. And then at the end of November, it was November 22nd of 2020, they contacted me and said, oh, we just looked at your list. We meant 40 children, not 40 families. And I had already you know, promised these families that their kids were going to get Christmas gifts. And all of these families had at least three or four children. So you can do the math. So after I, I had a panic attack, that was the first thing I did. I cried a little bit. And then the second thing I did was, reach out to my church family. And within 48 hours between you all and my very compassionate neighbors, we had everybody on that list covered. Um, so that was the first year. And then in 2021 and 2022, a lot of you um, helped out again as sponsors. And then last year, um, our own preschool here at Piedmont Progressive reached out to me and said, we would like some families to sponsor our, you know, our teachers want to help out, our preschool families um, want to help out. So we set up the tree and they asked for two large families. And uh, once again, Piedmont you, you members stepped in and helped because those tags were not leaving that tree very quickly at all. So um, you all have been part of this program since its beginning, um, but this year we're actually making it official with the social action team. So you will see again the, um, the giving branch, the giving tree in the foyer has tags. So um, there is a sign up sheet. If you do take one of those tags, go ahead and write down the family um, or the child's name that you picked. Um, Linda and Jack are um, handling all of this this year, so their um, email is in your order of service if you would like to take that tag and have questions. And then we just ask that you bring the gifts back um, either on December 3rd or the 10th. By the 10th would be great. That way I can get them distributed to the families. So if you have questions, let us all know. Thank you. Thank you, Becky, and thanks for your work throughout the year with Compassion Closet. And for other important information about our vibrant community, please see your order of service. There's a lot there. And if you're on our email list, please check our monthly newsletter and weekly announcements. Whatever brought you to this place at this hour, we welcome you. May you find something you need, and, you may, and may you leave richer in spirit than when you arrived. Just as we light our chalice this morning, and as the flame burns brightly, we remember the light that shone so brightly within each of our ancestors. 
We give thanks for this divine light that has been passed on to us. And today we fan the flames of that light so that we too might pass the light onto those who come after us. Please join me now in singing the words to lighting our chalice, the symbol of our faith. invite you now to please stand as you are willing or able for our call to worship found in your bulletin. Come, let us enter this space of hope and community. Come, let us enter this space where our sorrows, our joys, our passions, and our passions. Come, let us enter this space with the stories of our ancestors for their strength and wisdom beats in our hearts. Come into this space, friends, to the love of companions, to the room beside us. Come into this space, mindful that together we are building a future for other generations. Come, come, come into this space and let us worship. Let us remain standing as you are able. Our opening hymn is found in our gray hymnal, number 126. Come thou fount of every blessing.
be seated. And we are switching up uh, the order just momentarily today. Diane, you want to come up? Uh, you might recall that once a month during the regular year, we have a generosity moment. We usually do it around the offering, but Diane is going to do it because she's been helping out in the nursery, and which we have a lot of activity going on there. So, so before we have our time for uh, all ages, Diane is going to come and share um, about why she loves and supports our wonderful church. Thank you. So I'm Diane Dom. I am a member of our board, and as uh, Reverend Amy mentioned, I'm also usually working with our kids on Sunday, um, which has been a joy. Um, so I just wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, my connection to the church. So throughout the generosity campaign, we talked about lighting the flame for tomorrow, and I wanted to share how that has meaning for me. I started coming to church here in 2017. Um, my teenage daughter and I were looking for a new church home um, that was a little bit more consistent with our values. And our intention was to visit a number of different churches and see where the best fit was. But when we came here, we felt so welcome and we enjoyed the messages so much that we just kept coming here. Um, and we didn't look anywhere else. Um, I became involved in ethical explorations, so that's a great place for me to geek out with other people from the church who like reading books related to ethics, um, and that continues to be something I look forward to every week. Um, and just a little advertisement, we're getting ready to start a new book. We're going to do um, On Repentance and uh, Repair, which is... Um, the all UU church read. So if anyone is interested in joining us, um, please feel free to contact me or just show up in our Zoom meeting. Um, another of my earlier experiences here was a class called Cakes for the Queen of Heaven, uh, which was led by Reverend Amy Brooks, who many of you know. And it was um, a real opportunity. Um, it, the class was exploring the feminine divine. So I got to bring my teenage daughter and expose her to all these strong, um, wise women. And that was just such an, uh, a great experience for mother and daughter to do together. So through each of these activities, I have felt that flame uh, being lit in me. And I look around the congregation and I see so many others carrying that flame also. Um, through their commitment to the church as well as um, taking that flame out into the community with a lot of the community events we've been involved in and the social justice work. Um, and I've also watched my daughter really flourish. Um, she was part of our RE program here and she did um, the UU coming of age program along with uh, some people from the Charlotte Church. Um, and that really helped her to find her voice and I've watched her as a young woman now being involved in uh, Sunrise, which is a youth-led climate change movement. And so I really see how this church influenced her um, and really helped her find her voice. And, and one of the things I really appreciate about this church is that instead of asking me to believe in a specific doctrine, um, people in this church constantly challenge my ideas and really help me to think through things and I can be on my own uh, quest for truth and meaning. So um, I hope that our church will continue to light this flame for tomorrow. And um, especially um, as I see a lot of young families join us, um, influence the next generation of young people who will um, carry that flame tomorrow and beyond. So that's why I invest in our church's future. Thank you. Thank you. And now I'll go back and get our kids and bring them in for our story. Yes. <laughs> so we will have our time for all ages now and if there's any um if any of the children want to have a parent or an older friend come sit with them up here too that is just great so always happy to have anyone who would like to join us we have a wonderful book we're going to share It's 
good to see y'all today. How are you doing? <laughs> Everyone doing okay? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I have a, a wonderful book I want to share with you. It's called Remember. And it's actually a poem that was written by Joy Harjo. Uh, Joy Harjo is an indigenous woman who is a, a very well-known poet. And um, this poem is talking about her ancestors and everyone who is an ancestor and every being. So this book was illustrated by Michaela Goat. Y'all are welcome to come a little closer if that helps too, if you want to see this. You don't have to have the sun dry. There you go, buddy. Okay. All right. Remember. So here's this little girl who is remembering. Remember the sky that you were born under. Know each of the stars' stories. Yeah, we're all born under this wonderful sky. Remember the moon. Know who she is. Did y'all ever see the moon when it's out at night? Y'all seen the moon? Yeah. Yeah, I know. I love to see the moon. So. Remember the sun's birth at dawn. That is the strongest point of time. And we can definitely see the sun today, can't we? Yes. Remember sundown and the giving away tonight. When it starts, the sun goes down and starts to get dark. Remember your birth, how your mother struggled to give you form and breath. You are evidence of her life and her mother's and hers. So here's a little baby with the baby's mom and with grandma. Remember your father. He is your life also. Remember the earth whose skin you are. Red earth, black earth, yellow earth, white earth, brown earth. We are all earth. Remember the plants, trees, animal, animal life, who all have their tribes, their families, their histories too. Talk to them, listen to them. It's not, it's definitely not dark outside today. <laughs> These are all alive poems. All the earth, all creation we can see, they're alive poems. Remember the wind. Remember her voice. She knows the origin of the universe. Remember you are all people, and all people are you. Remember, all is in motion, is growing in you. Look at these big eyes. Remember, you are this universe. Can y'all see the, the girl's eyes? Can you see what's connected in there? Oh, the face. A face, that's right. Everyone is connected. And this universe is you. Remember, what kind of things do you see on this page, on these two pages that we can remember? A bear. Bear. A father. A father. A little girl. Little girl. <laughs> You'll see. Huh? There's lots of things we can help remember. So, what kind of things do you think it's important for y'all to help remember? <laughs> remember, remember to give your family a hug every day? Is that a good thing to remember? 
hug, a kiss on the cheek. Remember to tell people you love them. Yeah, because we're all connected and all family. So anyway, I am going to let this book go back in the nursery. Anyone in the nursery wants to look at this book, and I'll come by and get it later. Um, but it's just really good pictures and poems. So, so thank you so much for coming up and sharing with me today. And, uh, <laughs> thanks for dealing with the sunshine in your face, too. <laughs> It's so wonderful to be with so many wonderful children in our church um, and think about, I was talking to my mom recently when she was remembering some of the ways I would act in church when my grandfather was the minister and I always had lots to say, so kind of continues, I'm a minister, my son had lots to say in service, so, so I'm always so thrilled that when we have so many different voices who are gathered here with us and we can listen to them. We are now entering our sacred time of sharing, a time where we share our joys and our sorrows and our concerns and milestones. So for this week, we light a candle for Sue E., who has been in the hospital the last couple days with an infection. She is improving and hopes to go home either today or tomorrow. We light a candle for Risa's father, has some pretty serious health issues right now. For Jane's mother, with some ongoing health concerns. For all areas of violence around the wor world, and especially the war in Ukraine. For Transgender Day of Remembrance on November 20th. And for a full welcome, a full welcome and inclusivity for all our transgender siblings. We light a candle that a just peace will emerge with the war in Israel and Palestine. We light a candle for the growing incidents of Islamophobia and anti-Semitism and all who are impacted by this. We light a candle for the creation of a safe and accepting world for all people. Now at this time, you're welcome to come forward. You are invited to come forward against the outer um, aisle here along the wall. You may fill out a prayer card with your own um, joy or concern and hang that on the prayer wall. You may light a candle or simply drop a stone in our shared water. So I invite you to come forward as you feel called to do so. a few more candles for the things we hold in our hearts which remain unspoken and also for those who are joining us virtually to honor what is in their hearts as well. I invite us now into a time of quiet rest, meditation, or prayer. I will sound the singing bowl and then we will have a period of silence before Anne leads us with our musical meditation. Now during this period of silence I encourage you to um, as you sit and take good deep breaths to think about gifts from your ancestors, positive, wonderful gifts they have given you. And it can be spiritual or emotional or physical gifts, but the blessings you have received from them.
called tomorrow by Roberto Rios. You are not 15 or 12 or 17. You are a hundred wild centuries and 15, bringing with you in every breath and in every step everyone who has come before you. All the yous that you have been, the mothers of your mother, the fathers of your father. If someone in your family tree was trouble, a hundred were not. The bad do not win. And finally, no matter how loud they are, we simply would not be here if that were so. You are made fundamentally from the good. With this knowledge, you never march alone. You are the breaking news of the century. You are the good who has come forward through it all, even if so many days feel otherwise. But think, when you as a child learn to speak, it's not that you didn't know words. It's that from the centuries you knew so many, and it's hard to choose the words that will be your own. From those centuries, we human beings bring with us the simple solutions and songs, the river bridges and star charts and song harmonies, all in service to a simple idea, that we can make a house called tomorrow. What we bring finally into the new day, every day, is ourselves. And that's all we need to start. Look back only for as long as you must, then go forward into the history you will make. Be good, then better. Write books, cure disease, make us proud, make yourself proud. And those who came before you, when you hear thunder, think of it as their applause. When I was in divinity school many years ago, I noticed something quite remarkable during my first few days as a student. Now, new seminary students normally share about their spiritual journey and their calling in ministry. It's kind of part of the coursework. And I was astounded in those first few days how many of us had family members who were ministers. Parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, even siblings. Now my connection with my grandfather, a gifted minister, had certainly been important in my own, responding to my own call to ministry. So during those first few weeks of divinity school, I began to joke that ministry was a family curse. <laughs> I also started to quote the passage from the Hebrew scriptures in the book of Numbers that talks about how the sins of the father shall be visited upon the sons for generations to come. So. Now, not all my classmates appreciate my sense of humor back then. So. But I think if we look at the biblical narrative as a whole, and the biblical narrative not as pieces to be taken out and thrown as stones at people. <laughs> we know that God does not make children pay for what parents have done. Yet we do know that children have to deal with the impact of decisions made by their parents. Think of the simple facts of pregnancy, a birth mother's intake of food and drink impacts the fetus. The home environment impacts children as they grow up. 
being in a safe, supportive home or being in one that is unstable or abusive. Children are always impacted. Now beyond these basic concepts about how you know, sins or decisions that parents make impact children, there's really been some very interesting research about how the lives of our ancestors impact us in the here and now. And the impact is physical, emotional, and spiritual. Epigenetic studies reveal that one's genes can be changed based upon what our ancestors encountered or endured. I'm going to say this again. So, epigenetic studies reveal that one's very genes can be changed based upon what our ancestors encountered or endured. The first of these studies began in post-World War II with survivors of the Holocaust. People who had endured great evil and their genetic markers were changed. Great trauma changes one's genes and is passed down to the children. However, today, as we are continuing our focus this month with the theme of heritage, I want to talk about the flip side of what's passed down from our ancestors. A lot of very good things are passed down from our ancestors, whether they are biological or adopted. My daughter and I have had various conversations over the years about strong Rio women. And of course, we include women who did not have the surname of Rio with that. A number of years ago, my sister-in-law, who's my brother's wife, uh, gave me a Christmas present. It was a little hand towel that said, Mira, Mira on the wall, I am my mother after all. <laughs> and I asked mom, I said, think it's a compliment or not? What's your opinion on this? <laughs> and we laughed and you know it was a compliment from Susan and an observation of how much my mom and I are like. There's a lot of wonderful things that she has passed on to me spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Now the bad knees, you know, I, I, uh, I wish I didn't have those but that's just par for the course, right? <laughs> Carl Jung has some wonderful insights about continuing the inheritance that we receive from our ancestors. The inheritance, so many possibilities, what we receive. Jung says this. I became aware of the fateful links between me and my ancestors. I feel very strongly that I am under the influence of things or questions which were left incomplete or unanswered by my parents and grandparents and even more distant ancestors. It often seems as if there were an impersonal karma within a family which is passed on from parents to children. It has always seemed to me that I had to answer questions which fate had posed to my forefathers and which, which had not yet been answered, or as if I had to complete, or perhaps continue, things which previous ages had left unfinished. Now none of us can finish all the work in a lifetime that we choose to do. That includes our ancestors. Now all of us in some way or another, have had ancestors who have started some very positive, creative, progressive, spirit-filled energy and actions. And this includes our spiritual ancestors. So many Unitarians and Universalists have worked diligently to live out the principles that we hold so dear here in our faith community. So I want to highlight just a small handful 
of some of our UU U -U spiritual ancestors. Let's remember Clara Barton, the nurse who founded the American Red Cross and believed everyone deserved good health care. What a radical statement in today's world, isn't it? Let's remember Dorothea Dix, advocate for the indigenous mentally ill in the 19th century, and a political activist who created asylums seeking to help people in need and provide good, healthy places where they could work through mental illness. Again, another big need in our society still today. Let's remember Beatrix Potter and her creative love for children, who, which led her to write all the Peter Rabbit stories. Let's remember Lucy Stone, suffragist and abolitionist, who believed in equality for all people. Obviously, as we seek to continue the work that she did coming up on 200 years ago. And an ancestor does, spiritual ancestor does not necessarily have to be someone who is older than we are. So there's one younger woman who's still alive I'd like for us to remember today. Greta Gerwig, writer and producer who brought us the recent Barbie hit movie. If any of y'all saw that. A movie filled with great joy, but also themes of equality and inclusivity which were so profound it upset a lot of people who would rather not see those kinds of themes in our world today. Our Unitarian Universalist forebears, our spiritual ancestors, they weren't perfect because no person is perfect. And we can be inspired by someone and continue their work without placing them on a pedestal as some kind of saintly, holy person who did no wrong. Anytime we place them on a pedestal, it's a lot easier for them to be knocked off or to fall off. So today, as we explore our spiritual heritage, let's remember what our ancestors started. And let's keep working towards that work. It's doubtful, doubtful we'll be able to complete that work in our lifetimes, but we can make progress along this journey. Let's remember the social justice work, movements towards equality and inclusivity, the creative force which allows for the spirit to work in our lives and communities. We have such a rich spiritual inheritance. We have inherited so many amazing gifts from our spiritual ancestors, both individually and communally. Now, I know all of us know that we are living in a broken world. More parts of the world are at war today than any other time since 1945. Mass division, false information, religious justification for treating people as less than, even to the point of imprisonment and murder. There are not many easy solutions. There's some things which could be easy if we could get them accomplished and we are working diligently in those ways. But during this time where we see so much brokenness and it can feel overwhelming at times, the way that we can continue going about this work and going about it with courage and hope the way that we will have strength for our own journey and to continue while our ancestors started. We do that by caring for our souls, individually and collectively, 
and by accepting the strength and inspiration from our spiritual ancestors and from our spiritual family. There is great hope and joy in the world. As we work to continue while our ancestors started, as we work to go about living out our own principles of faith, today I encourage us to remember why our ancestors started, to being guided by hope and love and joy, and to pledge ourselves anew to continuing this beloved legacy. May it be so. Blessed be. Amen. Susan and Anne. It was beautiful. Thank you. Let there be an offering to sustain and strengthen this place, which is sacred to so many of us, a community of memory and of hope, for we are now the keepers of the dream. This month, we're sharing our offering plate with the Catawba Cultural Preservation Project. Since 1989, the Catawba Cultural Preservation Project has pursued their mission to preserve, protect, promote, and maintain the rich culture and heritage of the Catawba Indian Nation. At their location on the Catawba Indian Reservation in Rock Hill, South Carolina, the project provides cultural immersion classes, maintains an archive of historical records, works with archeological projects, and operates a craft store, both physical and online, featuring items, ma items made by Catawba artists and artisans. And you're always welcome to give online at PUUC.org or by texting PUUC at the number 73256. Today's offering will now be received with great gratitude. We give thanks for these wonderful gifts which help us to fulfill the mission that we have before us in living out where our ancestors started. Now, I invite you now to please stand as you are willing or able for our closing hymn found in our great hymnal, number 131, Love Will Guide Us.
before we extinguish our chalice, I offer thanks for all the many volunteers who helped make our worship service possible. Let us now take a moment to give thanks, either in our hearts or with words, for the things for which we are grateful today. I'm grateful for modern medicine. Gail is grateful for modern medicine, and we are too. I'm grateful you're doing so well. Grateful for Susan's gift of music and sharing that with us. Grateful to be able to have a place where people won't throw rotten fruit at me. <laughs> I'm grateful for Becky and all of you giving. Compassion for Positive and Christian Street. Yes. <laughs> Great. Grateful for Becky and everything she's done with the Compassion Closet. Grateful for nursery care. Amen. Absolutely. And I remember being grateful for that many years ago, too. Yes. For hope for a better tomorrow. For hope for a better tomorrow. Yes. I am grateful that the woman who told my sister who was shopping for a turkey that there was a shortage and none were available was teasing her. <laughs> Okay, Frank had a little scare about getting a turkey, but apparently that's going to be okay. So, <laughs> well, we. I'm grateful for all the turkeys. Grateful for the turkeys, yes. <laughs> well, we give thanks for all these things we hold in our hearts, and also the things which are not spoken, but which we carry with us with gratitude each day. We now extinguish our chalice, but we carry its light, its warmth, and its meaning with us until we meet again. May we go in peace, believe in peace, create peace wherever we may wander. Now for our closing hymn, we traditionally form a circle, and you may hold hands if you would like, but if you'd rather simply stand with the circle, you may hold your, place your hand over your heart. So. <laughs> 